So hello everyone. Unfortunately, um, not all are here yet, um, but we have to start now to stay in shadow. So, um, well, first of all, a warm welcome from me on behalf of Milehouse Electronic to all of you here for our second Tabo webinar with the title Advanced Direct Digital RF Waveform Generation and Acquisition for Operating Quantum Computing with Specialist John Merkett from Tabo Electronics. For all of uh, for all those who uh, who weren't there the last time, a few brief pieces of information about the two companies, Milehouse Electronic and Tabor. Tabor Electronics has been founded in Nesha, Israel, in the year 1971. It specializes in high-end test and measurement domain like multi-channel RF generators, arbitrary waveform generator, and transceivers, which are used for the applications in aerospace, quantum physics, radar, etc. Also, it has experience in the OEM domain like developing solutions for well-known companies like Kizait, Lecroy, Kisley, ETC. And now a little bit to John. Um, he is a field application engineer for Tabor and responsible for uh, quantum physics for Proteus products like arbitrary waveform generators and receivers. And we are very pleased that he is our presenter today. So then I will briefly introduce my company, Milos Electronics, founded in 1977. Milos Electronics offers know-how, innovative developments and individual customer-specific EMC compliance solutions for professional measurement technologies and data communication. Our product range includes measuring instruments, data lockers, interfaces, cable testers, softwares, as well as PC cards and components for Ethernet LAN generators, etc. You can find us at www.milehouse.com. Um, one more small uh, note, please leave all your microphones on silent and you can write your questions into the chat during the presentation but they will be answered only afterwards. So um, you can also write questions uh, by email to sales at milehouse.com, of course. We also record the webinar and make it available to you afterwards. So then we will come briefly to the topic overview. Um, the first topic is quantum research and quantum computing. It deals with the following subgroupings. At first, the application area, after that, the computing control model, the quantum computing basic research, and finally, about the timing constraints in this area. The next big topping is qubit control and quantum gates, and in it about the control pulses and the control pulse implementation. Then John explains how to measure the qubit state, how to implement it, and what to look out, look out for. And the last sub-item in the qubit topic is feedback forward cycle implementation. John concludes by explaining how the Tabor Proteus range of equipment implements what has been presented as well as its features and functionality. So, well then I will turn the word over to John now. Just one moment. So. Good job. Okay, I hope that you see my uh, slide now. Yes, we can see it. Okay, wonderful. So we well. can start. Then. Okay, thanks uh, uh, everybody for attending this seminar today. It's going to be quite a short, uh, so I'm going to go uh, to go fast uh, through the, the slides. As it has been said, uh, you can ask questions uh, during the seminar, but all the questions will be answered hopefully at the end of the, of the presentation. Okay, so the topic for today is, uh, you can read in the title of this slide, it's a patient digital RF way for generation and acquisition for operating quantum computing. Uh, Tabor has been a leading supplier of uh, signal sources uh, in the past, as it is today, and for many, many years our products have been applied to the area of uh, quantum physics and specifically for the quantum uh, computing uh, research area as well. What uh, we are going to introduce today in this seminar is going one step further 
to go from the uh, typical applications of when the quantum computing technology was uh, created and researched, but to uh, the next step, which is building actual operating quantum computing. And uh, we are going to talk about the requirements and also about the different solutions and also about the constraints uh, that the equipment being used in these applications have to match in order to uh, be successful. Okay, first of all, uh, what we are going to introduce today is, um, of course, valid for the quantum uh, computing uh, area, but it also can be applied to a different set of uh, other uh, fields, uh, application fields, like quantum electrodynamics, high energy physics, specifically particle accelerators, and plasma physics, as in fusion reactors. Because uh, in all of these areas, uh, many of the needs are very, very common. And at the same time, uh, we are going to introduce today uh, a special requirement for all these kind of, pro of systems and projects is the amount of uh, simultaneous signals that have to be both generated and measured, and the ways to implement these multi-channel systems with tens and tens of channels at the same time. Okay, the quantum uh, computing uh, is a very active research area. One of the very common thing is that uh, you need to uh, control or to monitor and to uh, analyze the state of uh, elements with the built-in elements of quantum computers, which are the qubits. Qubits uh, are based in many, many different techniques, so it's impossible to cover all of them. Although there are some main groups uh, grouping different technologies according to the basic principle of of uh, implementation, but uh, basically from the uh, electrical standpoint, from the way they are seen by the external equipment that is uh, taking care of them, is uh, basically a set of cavities, resonant cavities, where you uh, can set up quantum states by producing the right control signals, and you can read out those quantum states after some computation, quantum computation step, uh, by feeding some test uh, pools and then reading back the output of the system. So basically, that's what you can see here. You have this quantum bit. I'm using a very simple electrical model here, and then you can produce pulses. So this, uh, this, uh, the quantum state of this uh, quantum bit can be controlled. At the same time, you can also produce pulses that are read back at the at the end at the output of this uh, system. So the actual the current quantum state can be um, find out can be modeled. Okay, and, and one of the very important things here, what makes a big difference between the situation now with real uh, actual quantum computing and the quantum basic quantum research needs in the past, is the closed loop that you can see in this uh, very basic schematic. As you see, you need something that is capable of reading the state, the quantum state of different qubits, so finding out what the states are, and then depending on the on the quantum algorithm that is being implemented, produce the next quantum states for the next quantum computing step. So basically, it's a, a closed loop system. It's not deterministic because that's the purpose of quantum computing to produce uh, very quickly results that cannot be known in advance using uh, traditional methods, traditional computing methods. And then you have to handle this closed loop, and we will see some numbers later, very fast, in a very, very quick way, because all the quantum computation, all the steps in the quantum computation must happen while the quantum uh, coherence of the system is kept. What means that this must be done in times ranging from a few hundred microseconds to a few hundred milliseconds, maximum a few seconds. So everything must go very fast, real time very fast, in order to keep up with the uh, requirements of the quantum computing application. 
Okay, uh, so far this is a very typical uh, scheme to control and read out quantum bits. Basically, this is a very traditional uh, approach. You have to produce some pulses, RF or microwave pulses, to control the quantum state of the qubit. And those pulses have to be controlled in both amplitude and phase. So one way to implement such control is by producing I and Q quadrature information and then feeding a IQ modulator, a quadrature modulator. And then by using uh, this IQ signal, you can produce any amplitude or phase that is required for the controlled sequence. Okay. In order to read out, as I said before, you need to produce a different pulse going through the qubit system and then read back this uh, pulse, the output of this pulse. So by looking at the response, then you can tell which is the current quantum state of the system. Well, you need a lot of processing in order to find out that information, but basically this is the scheme. As you can see, for a single qubit, you need several signal generation channels. In this case, are baseband channels that so generate basically uh, low frequency or relatively low frequency non-RF signals, but they are converted to RF signals using external devices. In this case, a modulator or a mixer or some kind of uh, switch that can produce uh, the RF signal. In order to make this work, you need another component here for each one of these devices, for these modulators and mixers. You need a local oscillator producing the carrier, the RF carrier or microwave carrier, and what those frequencies must be generated. The same thing for the readout. In this case, you have to capture an RF signal or microwave signal. Typically, what uh, is done is you don't convert this signal to a lower frequency or you demodulate the signal, and then the signal is acquired for a single or multiple channel digitizer. This digitizer digitizes the signal and then uh, the signal is properly processed. And then hopefully we can close the loop. So depending on the algorithm that we are executing, the cycle starts again by producing the net quantum state. So as you see, even a simple qubit needs a bunch of signals to be generated, many local oscillators because also the long converter requires a local oscillator for the to convert this signal to an IF signal. So the phase information, the amplitude and the phase information is not lost. So even a very simple single qubit situation requires a lot of signal generation, acquisition and processing power in order to make it work. Well the traditional solution is what I am showing here. So you have a, a basically uh, of the shelf equipment that you can buy from different manufacturers and then you can put together uh, this uh, uh, test system by using those traditional instruments. Well, as I said before, one area of complexity of the system that you need at the same time different baseband, RF, microwave, digital, analog signals just to control one qubit. And uh, the traditional solution, the only way to scale up this is by keep adding more and more blocks like this. So this means that even for a limited system with five, 10 qubits, the amount of equipment here that you need to put together and to align and to adjust is just overwhelming in many situations. All these devices are typically, are typically uh, designed for lab applications where you don't need real time uh, closed loop control or real time signal processing. So, this means that you have a very uh, limited uh, power, uh, computing power and signal processing power. And of course, this gives you another important issue, which is that the time between your read and, and uh, uh, quantum state and the moment that you can actually control net. The next stage, what we could call the latency of the system, the time latency of the system is too big to implement uh, actual working quantum computers because uh, 
the system will not be able to cope with this uh, short, uh, with this small speed, just because it cannot keep the quantum consistency for so long time. Okay, so this is basically uh, the, the limitation of the traditional approach. We will go to this uh, in a little more detail later, but basically this is the traditional solution. In fact, the signals themselves that are typically applied to quantum qubits and also the signals that are written back from qubits are not very difficult, especially if you compare these signals. They are not very complex, especially if you compare these signals with the signals that are being uh, used today in wireless communication systems, uh, radar systems, and so on. Uh, typically, we are talking about pulses with uh, very simple shapes like uh, Gaussian pulses or similar. And uh, we have also to control the magnitude and the phase, but those are signals that are not very difficult to, to be created. And uh, that uh, they are not very high bandwidth. So typically creating these signals is not a big problem. Creating them in an effective way or a cost-effective way it is, but conceptually those signals are not very complex to create. But there is an issue in quantum computer which is very important. In fact, in any, in any quantum or physics application is that in all quantum physics applications, typically uh, noise, is a big uh, concern. So, uh, of, because of the noise, systems lose their quantum consistency very easily. And uh, this is why most uh, quantum uh, uh, physics applications require operating those uh, devices in very low temperatures, very close to absolute zero, uh, in order to keep the uh, uh, thermal noise very low. And that's always a, a, an issue as well in order to build those devices. But um, just uh, take a look to the situation in a quantum bit where you have to uh, both control and read down and read back the quantum state of this quantum bit. Basically, when you control, you know what uh, when you control what quantum bit you know what is the uh, the initial quantum state. And then you want to force the system to go to a different quantum state. In order to do that, you apply a sequence of pulses, like this one here, this is just one example. In this case, we have three pulses with different amplitudes, and this is A and Q. I is the blue, U is the red, so you are controlling both magnitude and phase. And then you go from one state to another state. The issue is that even if these pulses are very simple, and they are not very high bandwidth, any uh, lack of precision, any inaccuracy in those pulses will result in the deviation of the ideal trajectory, so you will end in a different place. So basically, what I mean is that the lack of accuracy of this signal will add the noise in the system. And uh, we are talking about tens of qubits or even uh, uh, hundreds in the future, and then uh, we are talking about uh, multiple of those pulses going around to the different qubits. And of course, uh, it's important to have a very high accuracy in order to load to low the, um, the noise in the system, but you have to also to make sure that all the, all the components in the system, all the generation and acquisition uh, blocks in the system are accurate and are uh, properly calibrated and corrected to the same standard, so they operate exactly in the same way. And that's probably one of the most uh, important things. So everything that is uh, adding complexity to the system is making the system more difficult to uh, align, so it will lower the accuracy of the system. So for instance, the more cabling or the longer cables you are using, the more amplifiers, the more external components like mixers, modulators, everything has to be aligned, has to be corrected in order to have the required accuracy. And the more different components you use, the more uh, unintegrated components, the more difficult it's going to be. The same thing for timing. Of course, uh, one of the issues here is 
is the amplitude and phase, but also you have to, to worry about the relative timing between all the different pulses going around to all the different qubits. So everything must be properly aligned in time because it would be the, the alignment in time would also add to the noise as well. So that's the real challenge to keep the accuracy that the quantum system requires. Of course, there are methodologies to, to live with some level of noise, like adding redundancy to the quantum computer and things like that. But of course, the lower the noise is from the beginning, the better computation, the more successful quantum computing system is going to be implemented if you keep the same number of qubits in the system. Okay, uh, well, quantum com an operating quantum computing uh, device can be seen as uh, looking at this uh, block diagram. I, take, I took this block diagram from some uh, scientific paper on this subject, but basically it's uh, very nice because it shows all the, all the blocks that I'm going to, to discuss today. In fact, uh, quantum computers are not self-sufficient by themselves. And they are typically uh, what I could call a quantum computing coprocessor. So they always work in conjunction with some classical computing system that is basically controlling the system, is obtaining the final results, and they are also validating those results. Because many times, as you know, quantum computing does not produce 100% error-free results, and those results must be checked by the classical computing outside the, the system. And then, this quantum computer processor, you have the quantum layer where the qubits are, but then you need something in the middle. And this is something in the middle, is what I call here classical to quantum computing interface. Basically, you can uh, uh, implement it in many different ways with many different architectures, but you will always find something similar to that. On one side, you will have to generate signal to control the quantum layer, to control the quantum bit. Those are analog and digital signals, baseband and error signals, a bunch of them. Then also you have to read back the, the quantum state, and then you need some sort of multi-channel signal and, uh, capture system. It could be a digitizer with some RF, uh, um, RF blocks to handle the, the signals at the right frequencies. And then in the middle, you have some real-time control. This real-time control is communicating with the classical computer on one side, but it's also closing the loop for the quantum computation. It's the only way to go if you want to go really fast. If we try to control multiple qubits from the traditional classical computer, it will be very probable that you will not be able to keep up. Anyway, it's important that all this uh, block and also the computer is connected to a very high uh, bandwidth interface. So uh, all the information can be shared very quickly, especially between the different qubits as uh, qubits don't operate alone. They need to know what is going on uh, uh, from other qubits as well. So you need to, to, to communicate all these blocks together. So basically this is the, 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 the block diagram. So if we take a look to the traditional approach using in basic research. Basic research, you have your classical computer here, and you have your signal generation devices, IWGs, vector signal generators, uh, modulators, meters, and then you have your uh, signal acquisition devices. It could be high-speed high digitizers, digital scopes, vector signal analyzers, and so on. And then those instruments, which are traditional um, benchtop uh, kind of instruments, they are connected to the classical computer using the traditional uh, interfaces used for instrumentation, such as GPIB, Ethernet, USB, uh, these kind of uh, interfaces. Of course, you cannot really close the loop here because you don't have first the signal processing, real-time signal processing capabilities required 
to do that. So the only way to process those signals is by transferring those signals to the computer, and then the computer decides what to generate next. And this is very slow for actual quantum computation. So this is basically a basic research, so you can uh, run what I could call a scenarios. A scenario basically is a, a series of states that you're setting um, in a non-real-time mode just to validate the quantum bit technologies or that if the quantum bit is, com if the quantum computation is feasible, but not to perform actual quantum computation. Okay, that, that's the traditional quantum computing basic research approach. Okay, uh, when we go to the generation part, when we want to generate qubit control pools, as I said before, typically they are RF microwave pulses with some shapes, and uh, to do that, you have several uh, possibilities. One of them is, of course, using, uh, as is shown in the first slide, it's showing uh, the qubit control uh, strategy. Uh, you can use a AWG to produce the A and Q signal, and then use an external IQ modulator. So at the end, you get your properly modulated uh, RF carrier with the full control of the magnitude and phase of this uh, signal. Of course, today we have fast enough generators to produce all these signals directly without the need for an external uh, modulator. So you can produce uh, the IQ modulated signal uh, directly from a negative way for generator. And this, depending on the sampling rate of these uh, generators, you can produce uh, an IF signal. IF signal are really modulated, so in order to reach the final frequency, you may need an external mixer. Or you can produce directly the RF signal. You have enough sampling rate. You can produce the RF signal either in the first Nyquist band of the generator or the second Nyquist band of the generator. So that's ideal in many situations. You can do that. It's ideal because you don't need external devices like the uh, modulator, but at the same time, it's much simpler, less costly, and uh, of course, at it is simpler. If you don't have so many components, it is going to be Sim more simple, uh, simpler to align, and more accurate as well. Okay, today some epitrogal for generation of devices can go one step further, and then they can not only produce a moderated signal that has been calculated previously, they can also produce in real time the digital modulation or the analog modulation of the signal in real time by using a digital app converter and IQ modulator as you see here. Basically, you produce the IQ samples in baseband at a lower sampling rate. They're interpolated internally and numerically they are um, converted to the final RF signal. Okay, so then you have an IQ modulator, a numerical one, so you can control the frequency and phase of this carrier independently from the wafer in the memory. So this means that you're going to save uh, memory because these IQ samples are going to be uh, sampled at a much lower sampling rate because uh, you are using an interpolator. At the same time, you don't need to change the content of the wafer memory in order to change the carrier frequency because the carrier frequency is controlled by those NCOs, numerical controlled oscillators. Okay. Okay, that's a very good idea. That provides even greater flexibility and greater um, accuracy uh, because, as I tell you, this is a numerical IQ modulator, so there are no uh, impairments that are uh, quadrature impairments that are going to be added by this modulator. In the previous scheme, an external IQ modulator using baseband analog signals will show many different uh, impairments that is another level of uh, accuracy that you have to reach and they have to be uh, aligned in order to avoid again adding noise to the system. Okay, 
no matter what you do, of course, uh, AWGs and cabling and featuring and all the components in your system are not going to be perfect. They are not going to have perfect flat frequency response. So no matter what you do, at the end you will have distorted signal. So one thing that probably you have to do in many situations is to correct those signals in order to compensate for anything, the generator itself, the cable, any amplifier, any external mixer that you may need for some of very high frequencies, whatever. And this is uh, done by characterizing the system and then calculating a correction, magnitude and phase, and then applying this correction to the signal so the signals are corrected. Okay, well, this is uh, easy to say, but it's not uh, so easy to implement. First of all, you have to align and characterize the system. So you have to calibrate the system somehow. And then uh, you have to calculate the correction filters. And specifically, you have to apply them. And keep in mind that for each one of the channels, for each one of the signals, you're going to uh, apply a different correction because each one is different. So this means that at least on paper, each one of the signals is going to be different even when you try to generate the same signal at the end. Well, uh, that's something that it can be done previously, so you can create your signals already with the corrections, or in some cases, if you have the right internal processing power in the generator, you can do that in real time, meaning that you can have a, a real-time signal processor inside the generator where you can uh, implement uh, the digital filter that will correct for those uh, impairments, um, linear impairments in real time. So this means that in this case, you don't have to modify the waveforms in the memory because they will be modified in real time to compensate for any error that you may have. At the end, the issue is I am going to have the right accuracy, the right quality uh, for the signal. And the fact is that, yes, you can. If you have the right uh, devices, with the right instrumentation, you can do that, okay? So you, this is one example of a very complex signal, 1.0 gigahertz bandwidth signal generated uh, with a AWG without any external RF uh, component where you can find a ultra wide and signal and everything is almost perfect. I mean, you see the flatness, the quality of the modulation, meaning that the accuracy, the magnitude and phase corrections are very good and a very complex signal. Of course, the signals that are going to be used in in quantum computing are not so complex, but the requirements for accuracy are similar or even higher than the ones you have in wireless communications. Well, the same thing that we have said for uh, the generation side can be also uh, set for the uh, acquisition side. The acquisition side, um, you may need to implement, uh, in order to properly analyze the signal, uh, the readout signal, something like this. You have to capture your signal and uh, you have to download, to down convert the signal uh, in order to have the uh, baseband behavior. So you're going to have the magnitude and phase of the signal as well. And then using this information, you can implement a qubit state detector using any specific algorithm analyzing the signal. In this case, this is something that ideally should be implemented as well in the acquisition side of the of the uh, processing chain. In this case, uh, just as we have talked about the full digital implementation of the digital out conversion and modulation, the same thing can happen in the digital out conversion. We can use uh, several steps of down conversion, fully digital down conversion, and then the final step can be a fully digital demodulation to baseband. So at the end, we can end in the magnitude and phase of the real and imaginary parts of the signal in baseband, doing that in a digital way and reducing the sampling rate. So uh, at the end, we finish in a very workable uh, set of signals. Just think about this. Let's say that we are capturing a 6 gigahertz signal. Uh, sampling rate has to be several giga samples per second in order to capture the signal. If we are using just a uh, few kilohertz or few hundreds of kilohertz uh, bandwidth for this uh, pulse, maybe we could uh, work with a few hundred kilosamples per second. Uh, but in order to do that, you have to 
uh, down convert the signal and then modulate the signal so you can just keep the magnitude and phase information and not all the carrier information that has to be captured in order to, to analyze the signal properly. So that's uh, something very similar. Okay. Now we have generated our signal. We have captured our signal, but we need to uh, do the close the closing of the loop, and the closed loop requires real time processing. Yeah, that's something that, uh, of course, when we try to design a quantum uh, a classical to quantum computing interface. We will design the gen signal generation part, the signal acquisition part, and we are going to design also the signal processing part, which is responsible of uh, synthesizing the signals, acquiring the signals, analyzing the signals, and also to take the decision in real time of what to do next, depending on the uh, quantum algorithm. And uh, well, uh, to do this, you need to create your own hardware slash software. Uh, so depending on the situation, you may uh, have a, a simple situation where maybe an interpreted language can work with a microprocessor of some sort. And then the other stream, you may have the need to create your own hardware because software processing is not enough. But there are some solutions in the middle when part of the processing is done uh, by hardware and part of the processing is done by software, by some internal processor. Uh, and one example of this is the ARPIQ um, library, Advanced Real-Time Infrastructure for Quantum Physics, where a general purpose CPU implemented in FPGA is used, along with some other um, hardware-based processing blocks. Okay. Uh, well, the speed is always a concern. It depends on the qubit technologies. There are qubit technologies that can be um, handled very easily by this situation, uh, but some of them can, may not be possible to create. For instance, supercomputing qubit requires a very fast solution, a very fast control solution, and typically uh, ARTIQ is not capable of handling uh, this kind of qubits because uh, it's not fast enough. Oh, nowadays, there are some other companies or some other groups uh, that are producing uh, libraries, IP libraries as well, for processing in real time uh, faster qubit systems. And then uh, all of them at the end are implemented typically in ASICs or FPGAs. For most situations, FPGAs are more accessible and easier to handle by uh, any research group in order to put together a solution. Okay, so this is a picture of what is necessary, of what are the constraints for this, uh, for this um, kind of application. In fact, the, the big issue for, for these uh, different application areas is, is the timing requirement. Timing requirements are very variable because as I told before, so before uh, the, the, the number one concern is the quantum consistency uh, time. So how long a qubit can keep its quantum consistency, and this means that uh, this this is the final requirement for decisions is to be able to perform all the steps in the computation before this quantum consistency is uh, lost. So uh, this means that for quantum uh, bit based in superconducting um, superconducting qubits. Typically, we are talking about hundreds of microseconds for the complete computation, a few milliseconds. And then in this case, you have to be fast enough to produce a closed loop uh, step in things like several hundreds of nanoseconds or a few microseconds. So that's a very uh, tight requirement for uh, the full uh, system. You need very fast generation, very fast acquisition, but you need even faster signal processing in order to to fulfill the requirement. Okay, in order to to serve this market and to solve this uh, application area, um, 
Tabor has introduced a new family of products in different form factors, uh, which is the Proteus arbitrary waveform generators and transceivers. So one of the main markets that we had in mind when we uh, designed this uh, family of products was quantum computing. I am going now to list a few of the keys of its uh, characteristics so you can see what is the potential. First of all, uh, as I said, there are several four factors. Some of them are benchtop or desktop units with up to uh, 12 channels in one single device. But probably for quantum computing, the most interesting, uh, especially for operating quantum computing, the most interesting form factor is the PXI four factor, so the modular factor. So you can keep growing your system by adding more and more modules. And uh, then uh, this means that you can have uh, tens of them, even hundreds of them, if you would require that, in a single system, in a very compact way. What you see here in the right is uh, one picture of the uh, arbitrary wafer transceiver module, which is three slots, PXI, and also uh, there is the AWG module, which is two, uh, two slots wide. So we are talking about the very high density because each one of these modules, you may have up to four channels per module and then you get samples per second generation, two channels of digitizers at 2.7 gigasamples per second, or one channel at 5.4. It's optimized for the signal generation, so you have, at the same time, as I told you before, this internal AFCOM digital converter and IQ modulator, as I showed you before, and also the internal digital down converter and IQ the modulator for the digitizer as well. And a nice thing for all of them is that you can set the current frequency for each one of the BC, uh, BCOs for this uh, numerical control oscillator independently. And you can even have more than one for each channel. So basically it means that you can have two IQ modulations working at the same time for one channel in real time. And each one of them can use different IQ data and different carrier frequencies simultaneously. We will see that in a later uh, block diagram. And also we can control the phase. So this means that you can control the relative phase when you use the same frequency for different uh, channels in the same or different modules, you can set up the relative phase. So you can make sure that the phase that you have in the different uh, qubits are in the different signals going to the same qubit uh, properly aligned. At the same time, there are eight uh, 1.1 gigabits per second market outputs, which are digital outputs, so you can control digitally anything in the uh, quantum uh, layer. It has a lot of power in relative to the way these uh, signals are generated. Uh, There's a huge 16 gigasamples way for memory, or you can split this memory in segments, and those segments can be sequenced with a very complex sequence. You can even use an input in the front to control in real time which, which signal to output at any moment in time. So you have a lot of capabilities regarding um, the way you control uh, this sequence of data. Of course, you can also uh, go uh, from one uh, signal to another depending on what is going on in the input part of the system, so in the digitizer. Okay, so it's fast, uh, and, but this is not everything, because uh, as I said before, you may have uh, all the power that you require for generation and acquisition, but you don't have the real-time close control loop, because uh, uh, you cannot uh, make uh, successful quantum computing. And then uh, we have a fast enough device to fulfill the requirements and the, that are um, necessary for rapid ions and superconductive qubits, which are the two most important families in the field of QB. And the key for that is that we have 
a, a FPGA internally for each one of the modules that is capable of controlling everything. And most important than that is that it's customizable. So you can custom uh, design your own application by producing your IP and downloading the IP, and then we provide you with all the support, even with the integration uh, services, and, you, and of course with all the IP required to control our hardware, so you're concentrating your application in the FPGA. That's uh, one of the tricks, and, and it's important, it's a very popular, it's a Shailin uh, Birtet uh, FPGA. And um, another important issue about this architecture is that this uh, FPGA is associated to each module. So this means that the more modules you add, the more computing power, the more processing power you add. So you can keep up with an scalable system, so you can work with 10 qubits one day and 20 the next day, and then you, when you double your signals, you will also double your computing and processing power because you are adding more FPGAs as you add more modules. So this is basically the, the idea. We'll take a look to a little bit to the generation side. As you see, we have four channels. In this one of the channels, you have the two IQ modulators I was talking about before. And then uh, all four channels can generate signals up to uh, 7.5 gigahertz, even more, directly. And then with the, uh, any number of carriers that may be necessary in many uh, qubit control situations, you may have to generate different signals at the same time or different time at different frequencies. And the flexibility of this architecture is just amazing because you can generate multiple signals with very low uh, memory usage and very low internal sampling rate, but you can keep this uh, wonderful and extreme um, modulation bandwidth and carrier frequency range. So if we take the first example I was setting before, and we apply Proteus to this uh, area, we have the same kind of qubit in the diversion refrigerator, and we have the same control uh, uh, signals and the same readout signals and so on. As you can see here, because we have uh, this uh, uh, scheme, we have the two RF outputs applied to read out pulses and so for the for the uh, quantum state control, and then we have the one channel digitizer reading back the output of the system to find out what the quantum state is. And as you can see, with one single module in this kind of scheme you can control two qubits. And even more interesting than that, this is a extremely compact device. And you don't need external. There is no modulators, there are no mixers, nothing. It's directly to and from RF and microwave frequencies. Okay, so because you have the um, internal FPGA, you have this capability of working that in real time. In a very low latency, so you can handle any qubit, uh, any qubit technology. So, if this is a, a plot diagram, simplified plot diagram of the Proteus unit, and then this is the uh, scheme, the, the block diagram I showed you before about a quantum computer with the classical computer, the quantum computer coprocessor, and the classical to quantum interface. And here, as you see, you can go through the different blocks, and then you can realize that all the blocks that you find in the right can be found in the left. So basically, this is a self-sufficient, complete uh, quantum to classical computer interface by itself. And then you can tailor it, you can custom it, uh, you can uh, custom uh, define the requirements for your specific situation. Even if you plan to develop your own quantum computing uh, control application or system in the future, you can validate your design and your algorithms by using the FPGA as a prototyping tool. 
So this is also a very interesting feature of this research. A powerful system that you can use that to do kind of a, a real world simulation of the final system that you maybe put put in together in the future. Okay, so just uh, go a little bit to the to the RF uh, performance. You see, this is uh, basically the uh, frequency response of the system. So by using corrections, in fact, you can uh, uh, work today uh, up to 10 giga samples per channel. There's a mistake here, it's for channels as well today. And you have more than 7.5 gigahertz usable bandwidth in the instrument. So this means that if your application goes to 8 gigahertz and below, you can generate and acquire your signal without any additional error device. If it goes beyond that, then you can use very simple mixers instead of modulators to get your signal working at any frequency. But uh, the, the, we have not only the 9 gigasamples per second unit, we have also 2.5 gigasamples per second unit and 1.25 gigasamples per second unit. And you can mix them together in the same system. So basically, this means that you can generate baseband signals, you can use also if you need for some reason external modulators and so on. The same architecture can handle any situation because you have uh, access to different models depending on the requirements of each one of the blocks or each one of the qubits uh, in your system. Okay, so the, the, those are some examples of actual complex signals being generated by by uh, Proteus. And as you can see, the, we're talking about high quality, levels of quality that are typically those of uh, uh, better signal generators. But with the difference that here we have a much wider modulation bandwidth, the capability of generating multiple carriers at the same time, and the capability of creating at the same time RF and non-RF signals with the same uh, device. For instance, here you can see some numbers for spectral purity. So this, uh, of course, this also translates into accuracy because in this case we're talking about the noise floor of the signal that we are generating, the, the background noise that is very low as well. Okay, uh, we have also um, very good linearity. So regarding intermodulation, here you see the two examples. This is a wireless communication signal. But the important thing, thing, thing here is the level of uh, spurious signals in the adjacent channels, which is, as you know, is produced by non-linearities in the system. And here we are having better than 70. We can reach up to 73 uh, dBs for this uh, 20 megahertz bandwidth signal. For instance, so that that's a very high level of accuracy for this system. And this is a, even a more difficult uh, system where you have a multi-tone signal with a notch. This can be also a very good nice signal to calibrate or to characterize the devices in your system. And here you can see the level of dynamic range that you can reach. Anything which is not linear will show up here as intermodulation products. As you can see here, we have a better than 75 dB as produced free dynamic range for this signal. So that's that, a uh, very high level of quality at gigahertz of frequency. The same thing happens for the, um, for the, uh, the, the types of part. In fact, this is a, a chirp signal that was being generated by the instrument. And then here you can see the signal in the the traditional DSA and a spectrum analyzer. And here you can see the same signal captured by the digitizer. And then by using the FFT, I can see the same spectrum with a very high accuracy. Okay, so that's a very, a very wide modulation idea. You can capture at the same time multiple carriers, modulated carriers. And again, you can apply the digital down conversion uh, to different frequencies. You can extract the different uh, uh, signals from the same acquisition as well, just like you do in a traditional spectrum analyzer or vector spectrum analyzer. So the generator works in the way we have been 
talking about before. We have this uh, real-time IQ uh, modulation with interpolation. But keep in mind, this is one of the architectures because that architecture is going directly from the memory to the DAC. So we can generate anything between DC and uh, 9 gigahertz. Okay, so that's uh, uh, something that you can also do here. And in the digitized sphere, we can also work with this long conversion. In this particular case, I'm showing how you can convert it not up to 9 gigahertz with this uh, device, and then now convert that to baseband by using the subsampling first and then the digital long converter section. So you can reach the FPGA where you have your qubit state detector working in real time. Regarding the control side, as I told before, you can see here the, the different approaches we have taken. Basically, uh, the system itself with the sequencer and the sequencing capabilities and so on is capable of doing many, many things without having to, to create any custom application. But if you need to, uh, or it's needed for the application, you can use the internal uh, FPGA, the uh, shielding virtual uh, FPGA. And uh, what we are doing now is uh, offering several approaches. One of them is that you can create everything from scratch. So anybody interested in creating a prototype with everything being controlled from its own, from his or her own uh, hardware can be implemented in the FPGA. Uh, you could use our shell. In the shell, basically, we provide the AP required to access all our uh, circuits in the Proteus. So you only need to concentrate in the processing blocks that you need for your application. Uh, we are also um, providing uh, application-oriented blocks. In this case, we implement those blocks in the FPGA. So users can wire up their own designs by wiring the, the blocks with them using SCAPI command or uh, control software, and then uh, setting up the parameters for these blocks. So you don't need to burn the FPGA to, to create an application. And for many applications, this is more than enough. So you don't need to be an FPGA programmer to do so. And finally, uh, we can even implement the standard open source um, available IPs for quantum computing like the Arctic or any other that could uh, show up in the future because, uh, of course, this is a general purpose universal FPGA, very fast one, so we can work with, uh, with any potential architecture that may appear in the future. Just to finish, I just want to give you a, an, an idea of, uh, of the level of integration and the uh, density. And of course, this translates into uh, lower cost of channel, faster integration and simpler integration, shorter cables, less external components. So that's a very important message for us to, to convey in this webinar, that is that, that, that the integration is of in this uh, in this platform. Here you can see uh, one of 19 inches PXI chassis with 10 of these modules in them. 10 modules means 40 channels because there's 21 slots. The last one here is a AWT, so we have 40 channels AWG and a GS sample per second and two channels digitizer. For systems where you need uh, more uh, acquisition, then this is the same thing. But in this case, we have seven AWTs with each one with four generation channels and two acquisition channels. So we have 28 channels generation and 14 channels digitizer. And uh, keep in mind that each one of these modules has eight digital outputs and two digital inputs that can be used also in the uh, internal uh, FPGA as well, if required. Okay, so that's basically the webinar for today. I want to thank you for all your attention. And uh, of course, the, you have here our contact information. 
you have some uh, question or doubt or you need some some uh, technical advice or occupation uh, uh, please don't uh, hesitate to contact us and we will try to do our best so i don't know